Welcome everybody to what is part four of our Next Fest 2023 coverage. With this, we are about halfway done with the festival. So get ready to enjoy yet another night of some fantastic indie games. We are starting off today's episode with Dice Folk. This is a, I guess, monster dice builder roguelike. When chaos threatens the land, it's up to us and our army of chimeras in order to save the day using the power of dice. So the game itself kind of mixes dice style combat with a Pokemon-esque monster collector. The dice at the bottom of the screen represent your side's actions on the left, enemies' actions on the right. You are forced to make use of all the enemy actions while you are free to kind of choose which one of your actions to make use of. This is important because the order in which actions are done will affect kind of the character's abilities and other things. Whoever's in kind of the front position is considered the leader and will be your primary target. However, every character or every kind of species may have special abilities that proc based off of different circumstances, like if they've taken damage, if a character's been hit, and so on. As you explore each area, you'll get to choose from one of the three shrines in each point for a new monster to join your little party, but you can only choose one per area. So you're going to be very careful as to who's going to help you the most and how this synergizes with your other characters and the equipment you're using. The game looks like it can be a little bit on the challenging side, as whatever monster you choose and whatever equipment you find will greatly impact the difficulty of each area and each boss. But I really enjoyed this one, and I would like to see if there's any kind of like dice manipulation, dice growth, anything along those lines. But Dice Folk is looking to, to be a very solid, again, Dice Builder roguelike. And for fans looking for another take on the roguelike formula, this could certainly be one worth checking out. We now turn to No Creeps Were Harm Tower Defense. This is the latest game from MinMax Games, the makers of Space Pirates and Zombies. And we're trading in the space, the pirates, and the zombies for creeps, towers, and laning. We have been sent to various planets to protect mining operations as a brain or brian in a jar from an ever escalating amount of creeps trying to take over. This is kind of traditional or classic tower defense rules, as you'll be able to upgrade your turrets set up walls in order to provide pathing for your various creeps, and gain ever more levels of power, new turrets, and so on and so on. You can rush the waves by clicking the button at the bottom of the screen, but there didn't seem to be the ability to kind of fast forward, at least not from what I saw in the UI. From what I played of this one, it's looking to be a very solid and kind of traditional tower defense. I was hoping to see, I think, a little bit more variety or like a unique selling point here. Something even along the lines of like what we saw with Gemcraft. There are artifacts you can equip that can change certain properties of your towers, but I'm not quite sure just what the extent of that is going to be in the main game. It does look like there's going to be a lot of tower defensing to do in this one. So if you're someone who's hankering for some good old fashioned lanes, walls, and lots and lots of towers, this could be one worth checking out. We now turn to Devil's Dive. This is an action roguelike similar to that of Downwell. When the devil is locked out of the netherworld, we are going to break in and descend down in order to reclaim the throne. The general gameplay should be very familiar to that of Downwell, with the difference is that we now have full 360 degree aiming with our shot. You'll hover, flutter, and try to bounce off of enemies as you continue your way down. The more enemies you bounce or kill within your combo will earn you more gems. Blue gems are used to buy more health and items. Red gems can be used to upgrade your weapon for whatever that run may be. 
The more you play, you will unlock more characters in your starting area, which will provide you with more resources and services. All in all, the gameplay itself was just okay. The big issue is that there doesn't seem to be, at least at this moment, too much of a major difference in terms of the design compared to Downwell. Now, we only got a chance to play up until the first boss, and the boss fights are noticeably different there. But I feel like this is a game that's going to have to do a little bit more in terms of level design and variance, if it wants to stick out further compared to it. So if you did enjoy Down Well and looking for another take on it, I would give this one a check. But if you have yet to play that one, I would highly recommend looking at that one first to get your descending fun out of the way. We now have Boomerang Jack. This is an action adventure game where you play as well, Jack. He is hunting down the evil pirate king who is threatening the world with a very unexplained plot at the moment. And it's up to us to use, well, the power of apparently lots and lots of boomerangs in order to save the day. The gameplay itself is played action adventure style. You have different combos relating to light and heavy attacks, as well as a parry, dash, and even a kind of like stun bomb you can use. There is a full on combo system and grading system in this game much like that of Devil May Cry. And the game definitely throws a lot at you and you throw a lot at it. My main issue with this game is that because of the zoomed out nature and kind of like limitations of the character models, it's very easy to just completely lose what is going on in these stages. From bombs exploding, boomerangs flying, you dashing, kicking, and so on. The demo that we played definitely showed a lot of variety in terms of movement and combat, including a boss fight. And there are multiple different levels as well, and I'm curious to see if there's any kind of like hidden or side content in the game, or it's all just kind of like, so it was like a single player linear game. If you're a fan of action games and looking for one where, well, you're going to be using a very un or non-traditional weapon for an action game, then I would definitely recommend at least checking out Boomerang Jack. Now we have Distobel. This is a Metroidvania. The kind of aesthetics of this game remind me of something like the old like Hudson Soft style like 2D platformers. But our gameplay here is a mix of kind of spell casting and fighting off lots of enemies. The demo itself is split between three levels of exploration, boss fight, and kind of arena battle. So we didn't really get a good idea of I think the overall gameplay loop of this one. But kind of our main mechanic here is switching between different spell types, namely fire, ice slash uh, water, and electricity, or red, blue, yellow. Whatever color you are, you are immune to damage from that projectile type, and enemies of the same color will take no damage as well. So you're going to have to swap between your colors, kind of like in the sense of like Ikaruga, in order to properly defend and do the most damage. My main issue with this one again is that as a Metroidvania, we really didn't get a good look at kind of the overall feel of this one. The individual elements are well done. I like the aesthetics of the game. It controls very nicely. The fireball is still like a little weird in terms of projectile as it when you shoot it, it automatically starts going down to the floor, which makes it almost near impossible to hit something unless it's like a foot in front of you or you're jumping in the air. Nevertheless, I think there is something here as a charming Metroidvania, and I'm curious how everything is going to end up in the finished version. We now have Ugly, and despite that title, this game is certainly anything but. This is a 2D puzzle platformer where you play a mysterious guard in a ruined palace, who one day gains the power of, well, a magical mirror shard that allows him to split himself into kind of his real self and a reflection self that will, of course, mirror everything that he does. So the puzzle solving here 
is how you set up your kind of mirror clone in different areas. It will mirror you exactly. If you climb up a ladder, it will climb up a subsequent one. You can also kind of operate on both sides of the same mirror so that if you go left, it goes right and that kind of thing. And the challenge of the game is going to be setting up for swapping the two kind of characters from one another and using them to hit different areas, get keys, etc, etc. In terms of the puzzle design itself, I would say it is on the moderate side. It can be a little tricky as you try and grasp how the reflection will work, but once you get that down, it should be relatively simple to get through. I really do love the aesthetic of this game. Some of the animations and just environmental details are very fantastic, and there's definitely a lot more going on here. Supposedly, at least from the end of the demo, there is a boss fight, and I'm kind of fascinated to see how bosses are going to end up in this game. If you are a fan of puzzle platforming and looking for another solid one, then definitely check out Ugly. We now have Cosmic, A Journey Among Shadows. This is a Metroidvania kind of light base uh, platformer. We play a spirit in a very strange dimension and we have lost our shadow. A creature has kind of become our little like tethered to us and can only appear when we are in direct light. In order to figure out what's going on, we're going to explore, platform, and look at some very impressive and unique visuals. The aesthetics and art style in this game are really well done. With that said, it is very dark. And I know a lot of this game is about lighting, but I would highly suggest raising the gamma a little bit higher than you would normally do for games like this. The kind of rules of the world is that certain things will exist if they are in light. This can include platforms, your ability to attack, and so on. You pick up these kinds of like dark fireflies that act as a currency as well as ability to set up save points throughout the area. There are kind of hard save points that are free to use, but otherwise, they are pretty much stretch out very far. The game controls pretty nicely. You'll have access to jump, wall jump, including a double dash you can perform in the air, and I'm sure you'll gain other powers along the way. The kind of limited save system is a little bit frustrating, and when I said there you can go quite a distance, you, that was not hyperbole. Some of these areas can stretch on multiple kind of massive rooms, and dying will send you all the way back to your last save point. All in all, this is definitely one to keep an eye out on. I would like to see maybe like a little bit more guidance to the player at the start in terms of the platforming and general movement tech and even just some semblance as to kind of like how things are going to work here. But if you're looking for a very visually interesting Metroidvania to play, then definitely check this one out. We now there's something a lot brighter and that is Lil Guardsman. This is kind of like the more... I guess kid friendly or I guess more happier version of Papers, Please. When Lil has been tasked by her father to man his guard posts in a fancy kingdom, she soon stumbles upon a massive conspiracy that threatens the kingdom and it's going to keep her from being able to do things that she wants to do. Your mission is to interrogate and talk to a assortment of fantasy creatures to figure out whether or not they should be allowed through the gates. Your tools will allow you to gain information and the game is kind of set up a little bit more puzzle focus compared to Papers, Please. You have three quote unquote action points that you can do per character. This involves talking to them, using your tools and so on. And you're trying to get as much information as you can to get the best choice, which will then earn you four stars for that encounter. As you make certain choices, of course, people will remember them, and I'm sure this will add some kind of variance or storytelling as the game goes on. The game itself is definitely written more on the humorous side, and the humor can admittedly be, I think, a little bit hit or miss here, depending upon what you like. 
but the general gameplay here is solid. If you enjoyed Papers, Please, and looking for a kind of different take that is a little bit easier to grasp, yet still its own unique game, then I would check out Little Guardsman. We now have the Master's Pupil. You are playing inside the eye of Monet, the famous artist. And you're going to have to do a variety of puzzle platforming and puzzle solving to help him finish his masterpieces. This is a physics and color base kind of puzzle platforming. As you'll need to guide various kind of colored vents and objects to these, I guess, suction things in order to get them to let you pass. You can also change your own color by going into different color vents, and yes, you will be mixing colors as well. Get through the area and you'll move on to the next, and the game kind of follows the life of Monet. The aesthetics of this game, obviously, are very fantastic. I like the kind of hand-painted look and feel of it. The puzzle solving, I would say, is on the moderate side. You can kind of sequence break a few times if you can really get the platforming and physics to go your way. But all in all, this is one of those games that once you kind of grasp the underlining rules for how things work, it shouldn't give you that much of a trouble. Still, if you're looking for a very interesting puzzle platformer, and again, one that is a visual treat as well, then definitely check out The Master's Pupil. We now have Rattopia. This is a colony sim in the similar style that of Auction not included, except this time Auction is included. And instead of clones, we are dealing with rats. When our rat kingdom is destroyed thanks to a vicious coup, it is up to us to rebuild in the neighboring land. We will have to attract settlers, build up our supply of food, get housing, class structure, and capitalism going in our lovely new kingdom. The game itself is played out, again, much like in the auction not included style. The in entire thing is kind of sideways view. You'll be issuing orders to your various characters who are procedurally generated. They'll come with various stats, as well as different personality traits that affect what jobs they are best suited at. As you explore the world, gather resources, and construct new stuff, you'll be able to unlock additional services, buildings, and more from the research screen. And there is also going to be combat. You can also lead your rats into glorious combat. Hopefully. From what we play of this one, the tutorial is admittedly on the slow side. It does take quite a bit to get going. Once you start getting some people working for you, a lot like the basic minutia gets taken care of thanks to them. And there's definitely some charm here. I'm curious to see kind of where things will go and whether this will be like a happy kingdom or we're going to end up in like some like Secret of Nim <laughs> kind of horror show. We now have Rad Survivor. This is, well, as I'm sure you probably guess, another indie vampire survivor bullet heaven style. Taking place in what I believe to be some accurate representation of Australia, it is up to us to survive the outback from all manner of enemies, collecting nuclear wastes in order to evolve slash gain new abilities and powers. As you gain new kind of transformations, they'll give you new ways of attacking, and certain abilities have a chance to go bonkers, which is like a super crit version of that ability. The game does feature something different for the vs like formula, that you have a hunger and thirst meter underneath your health, and if you let either one empty out, it will affect your character. When night falls, you are invaded by, well, vampires. In order to survive or avoid them, you can hop inside a nearby bunker to sleep it off, and then come back during the daytime. Just like with any game of this design, there is persistence in the form of unlocking new mutations, new bonuses, upgrading your base stats, and so on. 
I like the aesthetics and kind of the art style of this game. It's very animated, very bright, which is quite different from quite a lot of the other VS Lakes we've shown here and on previous showcases. All in all, you're going to hear this next sentence a lot as we cover a lot of VS Lakes during the showcase. So if you're someone who is tired of the Bullet Heaven formula, then this game is not going to change your mind in any way, shape, or form. But if you're still enjoying these style of games and looking for another one in the genre to check out, then I would recommend looking at Rad Survivor. We now have Card Bob. This is an action roguelike where you play as a cardboard box turned hero. We have to explore miscellaneous dungeons in the future, looking for power-ups and items to go back and sell in order to try and figure out what is happening and maybe save the day or turn a profit at the end. The gameplay here is a mix of kind of melee and range. You can throw your sword as kind of a range move as well as gain additional swords that you can throw during combat. The scarf that you wear is your actual health bar. As you explore the world and level up, you'll be able to choose from different perks. And the kind of persistent element is finding items that you can then kind of shuttle out of the dungeon to then sell at various vendors outside. And the money that they give you is what will allow you to add permanent upgrades. So this will add additional stats to your character or unlock new things that will show up in subsequent runs. The kind of main issue that I have with Card Bob is that the general combat doesn't feel as, I think, tight as we would come to expect from the style design. You know, games like Hades, Curse of the Mad Gods, and so on. When you hit enemies, they don't really respond to either your sword or your fling sword. And it's one of those games where it is very easy to take lots of damage and just get wiped out fast. Now we didn't really get a chance to see like the overall progression in terms of how much that will help you or change subsequent plays. But again, the basics of this game I would say are solid and like with a lot of the other roguelikes we've played here for Next Fest, I really want to see kind of more of where things will go in the finished product. And if you are looking for another action roguelike to check out, then I would at least give this one a look. And with that said, that is night number four done. We'll be back with part five tomorrow. Be sure to check out all the games listed down below. Do all that YouTubing stuff people tell you to do. If you're interested in my thoughts on design, check out my game design books wherever they are sold. Visit our Discord and Patreon and come back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom where some of the art and science of games.